Today we're going to be going over chapter 13 on experiments. This is the last chapter of unit 3 and then you're going to be reviewing unit 3 and getting ready to take a test after we finish this chapter. So first we're going to talk about the difference between an observational study and an experiment. In an observational study you are strictly observing the choices that the subjects are making. You are not manipulating them or assigning them into groups where you're choosing for them. You're just observing the choices that they make. You can have a retrospective observational study or you can have a prospective observational study. The retrospective observational study means that the uh, researchers are choosing the subjects and they're observing the choices that they have already made regarding their parameter of interest, which means like what you're doing the study on. In a prospective study, the researchers are catching the subjects early in life before they make those choices and then they're collecting data and tracking them, um, the subjects throughout their life regarding what choices they make. Here's an example. In 1981, researchers compared the overall academic performance of students enrolled in music classes to students not enrolled in music classes to see if there's an association between learning to play an instrument and the person's ability to succeed in school. The music students had a higher GPA of 3.59 compared to the non-music students' GPA of 2.91. This is an observational study. We are not assigning some students to take music classes and some not to take music classes. We're simply, obser simply observing the choices that they have already made. This is a retrospective study because they've already made their choice whether or not they want to take music class by the time we observe them. If we wanted to make this a prospective study, we would have to catch them early on like in elementary school and then track them throughout their school years to see if they choose to learn how to play an instrument and take music classes or if they choose not to. Is this enough for a cause and effect relationship? No. You cannot prove a cause and effect relationship with an observational study. There appears to be some kind of association between these variables, music education and better grades. However, we do not have enough to show that playing an instrument causes someone to be smarter. You might think so if you're in the band, but we don't have enough to show that right now. There are lots of other things you want to consider for other reasons. You could choose to study music because you might have better work habits, you might enjoy an academic challenge, you might have more parent support at home, you might have more financial advantages. There are lots of other influences that could potentially cause those students to have higher GPA other than just the fact that they studied music. The only way we can know for sure if a relationship is cause and effect is to do an experiment. In this kind of situation it wouldn't make sense to do an experiment because you wouldn't want to force some students to learn how to play an instrument and some to not learn how to play an instrument and then just see if the ones that played an instrument were smarter. It would be really unethical. So sometimes it's not possible to do an experiment. In an experiment, treatments are assigned by the researcher. They are not chosen by the participant. Assignments of the subjects to treatment levels are done randomly, most likely you use a random number generator. Subjects who fit certain criteria we need for the experiment are the ones that are chosen. If you're doing an experiment to test a certain medicine for um, you know, its effectiveness in treating a heart condition, you want to pick subjects who have that heart condition. So the subjects are not chosen randomly, they are randomly assigned to their treatment groups and then we compare them later on for the effectiveness of whatever it is we're looking at, the parameter of interest for that experiment. Okay, to make the music study an experiment, we would have to assign half the children to take music lessons and forbid half the children to take music lessons and this would, uh, and then compare their grades over time. This would be unethical, so this is not something we can do as an experiment, which I already talked about a little bit. Three principles of a well-designed experiment. These are three things that an experiment has to have in order to be a good experiment, and you're going to want to know those three things and be able to explain how they exist. Control. This is limiting outside factors other than the one we're testing for as much as possible and using a control group or a placebo group which is like a sugar pill if you're doing um, pills uh, or testing a drug if possible. Sometimes it's not possible to have a control group but definitely you would want to have one if it makes sense for the situation you're in. Randomization. You don't randomly choose subjects, you randomly assign subjects to their treatment groups most likely with a random number generator. Replication. 
This means that you should have multiple subjects in each treatment group, and you should remember that experiments should be performed more than once to confirm results. More than likely, you're going to be just performing your experiment once, but just know that you know, real statisticians don't do an experiment once and then stop. They experiment for years and years and years before they, you know, declare a drug safe to be used, things like that. Okay. Here's an example. A researcher wants to find out whether mice will run through a maze quicker during the day or at night after training. He has 100 mice available. He randomly assigns 50 of them to each group. The first group training during the day, the second group training at night. Each mouse is trained the same way. The last three times are recorded. We're going to look through these three elements, control, uh, randomization, and replication. Control. Each mouse is trained in the same way. We're controlling the outside elements other than the one we're testing for. The last three times are recorded for each of the mice. This is consistency. We're not recording the first time for one mouse and the last time for the second mouse. We're recording the same time, the last three times, for each of the mice. Randomization. The mice are randomly assigned to their treatment groups, whether they go in the day group or the night group. It's not like the mouse gets to choose. We're randomly assigning them. Replication. 50 mice are used in each group, that's replication, and also the uh, mazes are run multiple times, that's also replication. Factors and treatments. A factor is the variable we're studying for in the experiment. You can have more than one variable, or you can have just one. Treatments are the groups that we assign the subjects to. For example, the mouse experiment we were just looking at, there's one factor we're studying, their speed for completing the maze. And then there were two treatment levels or two treatment groups that we looked at, the day group and the night group. Here's another experiment. Researchers are studying the effects of drinking orange juice and exercising regularly on blood pressure. They choose 120 male subjects between the ages of 35 and 45. They take their initial blood pressure. Subjects are randomly assigned to drink or not drink a glass of orange juice each morning and to exercise or not exercise for 30 minutes a day. After six months, their blood pressures are taken again and compared to the initial reading. We're going to identify the factors in the treatments. The factors are the variables that we looked at in this experiment. There are two factors, whether or not they drink orange juice and whether or not they exercise regularly. There are four treatment groups. You can be put in the group that drinks OJ and exercises. You can be put in the group that drinks OJ and does not exercise. There's a group for no OJ drinkers and exercisers. And then there's a group for no OJ drinkers and no exercisers. Four groups, four treatments. Types of experiments. You can have the completely randomized design, the randomized block design, or the matched pairs design. In the completely randomized design, we randomly assign subjects to their treatment groups using a random number generator. We compare their results later on in the end. In the randomized block design, we first block the subjects by a variable such as gender, keep the males and the females separate, race, keep the whites and the blacks separate. Then we assign them to their treatment groups within each block using a random number generator, and we compare the results in the end. In the match pairs design, each subject undergoes each treatment, and we compare the individuals with themselves for the different treatments. Here's the uh, different design types in diagram form. Um, for the completely randomized design, this is information about a tomato experiment. We started with 24 tomato plants. We put them into three groups, and each group got eight plants. So the first group had no fertilizer added to the tomato plants. The second group had a half a dose of fertilizer added. And the third group had a full dose of fertilizer added. In the end, we compared the tomatoes for their juiciness and their tastiness. We're trying to see if the fertilizer makes them juicier and tastier. The matched pairs design, we would um, first pre-assess each subject put all subjects under all treatments, and then compare or post-assess them to see how they were in their post-assessment versus their pre-assessment. Here's the randomized block design. This is the tomato experiment, but in block form. If we bought 12 plants from one store and six plants from another, we want to keep those plants that come from a different store separated, so we'd use a block design. Block A is the plants from one store. Block B is the plants from another store. When you, um, after you assign them to their different blocks, then you break them up into groups from there. So with the 12 plants that are coming from the one store, 
four of each plant is going to each of the different treatment groups with the six plants that came from the other store two of those plants are going into each treatment group and then at the end we compare each block for their uh, juiciness and tastiness blinding this is a way to avoid bias in experiment blinding occurs when those who can influence um, the outcome um, or who are evaluating the results are not told which treatment method that they are working with for example if you're working on a drug experiment, you wouldn't want your subjects to know whether they were given the drug or the placebo. They should be blind to the experiment. And in the tomato experiment, you wouldn't want the people judging the tomatoes and eating them to see um, which brand of tomato they had or whether they had the fertilizer added or not. That might influence their opinion on whether that tomato was extra juicy or not. They should be blind in that experiment as well. Double blind, this means that you're blinded in two ways. The subjects themselves don't know which treatment they were given, and the people who are evaluating the subjects don't know which treatment they were given. For example, this is done a lot in medical experiments. The uh, subjects shouldn't know whether they're taking the actual drug or a placebo drug. The doctors who are evaluating the patient shouldn't know whether the patient has been given the actual drug or the placebo. That might affect their evaluation of the patient. Only the researchers who are conducting the experiment know which assignment went with which person, and therefore that would be a double-blind experiment. Confounding and lurking variables. These are two uh, factors or two variables in your situation that aren't isolated from each other, and therefore we don't know which, um, which variable was causing which effect in the end. We did not block them away from each other. For example, a professor experiments with the effect of his teaching style on his students evaluations of his class. In the fall he maintained a subdued, subdued demeanor and in the spring he had more enthusiasm. Evaluations in the spring were better but we don't know if this was because he changed his teaching style or because the season change um, might have had an effect. Sometimes in the spring people are happier in the fall when it's fall and winter when it's colder people just are more depressed. So there's no way to know for sure whether the change was because of the season or whether the change was because of his teaching style. He should have done two different teaching styles all in the fall semester or all in the spring semester. So these are confounding variables or lurking variables. Here's another example. Credit card company offers 50,000 people a low interest rate and no annual fee and offers 50,000 other people a high interest rate and a $50 annual fee. The lower interest rate and no annual fee group had the higher response and acceptance, but we don't know whether this was due to the lower rate or if it was due to the lack of fee. They didn't isolate those variables from each other.